Hey everybody, today we're going to do a recording of Foundry VTT modules that are going to help you convert from Roll20. I am a experienced Roll20 GM. I've been using Roll20 for a long time. I love it. I highly recommend it as a tool for people who want to run D&D and other games like that from home. However, I'm switching to Foundry VTT, which is a slightly newer I've already done videos on it and uh, kind of gone into some of the reasons why I want to switch. But I'm going to make a video to summarize some of the exploration of Foundry VTT modules so that you can uh, maybe skip some of the learning that I did, check out what I'm using, mix it with some of the stuff that you found. Um, but this is, this is just what I've learned. It was pretty time intensive to go through all of these, but I took some screenshots. I took some screenshots of settings and I'm hoping that this is valuable to you. So first off, what am I going to cover? I am, I've already covered my isometric hex trick. This is what I use to play isometric, even though isometric grid support isn't fully there in Foundry VTT. But I'm going to go through a couple extra things uh, in this video, and then I'm thinking of uh, some other videos that are coming up. So I'm going to cover whether or not you actually need modules in Foundry VTT, sort of what I've found. Some one must have module that I highly recommend everybody install. And then a series of modules, a whole bunch of them actually, that I found useful as a Roll20 person so that Foundry VTT would be familiar to me and to my players who are like me going to be switching over to this new tool and I want them to have an easy transition. Then I'm, you know, in future videos, I might cover some things that really take Foundry VTT far beyond either its install setting or uh, far beyond, you know, what maybe other VTTs are capable of. And I'm gonna go through some of the advanced modules and, and I'm even talking to some of the software developers of people making uh, tools that will let Foundry VTT run in isometric. People know I really love running in isometric grid, uh, but we can save all that for future videos. Before I jump into exactly which modules, let's talk about whether or not you need a whole bunch of modules. The answer is yes and no. Foundry VTT is an excellent tabletop tool. You do not necessarily need to run your D&D rule system or run uh, all the complexities of a role-playing game inside the tool itself. It is entirely acceptable just to use it for a map and tokens, maybe a little bit of dynamic lighting, maybe some special effects. You do not need to go overboard with your use of your VTT. It is entirely acceptable. Your players may even enjoy it more. I mean, talk to them to play D&D with paper and pencil or to have all the rolling occur somewhere else, like in D&D Beyond or maybe in a Discord server that you're using. Foundry VTT can automate just about every part of your D&D game, but it doesn't necessarily have to. That's gonna put a lot of complexity and learning in just one tool and the players may not actually like that. So talk to them, figure out what you're gonna do. But you don't necessarily have to do everything in Foundry. Uh, Foundry has everything you need for it to be maps, tokens, even the basics of some of the games without having to involve any modules. Introduce some simple modules first. And don't feel like you have to go through every single module that's out there. Use Foundry D VTT, play with it a little bit, run a little sample encounter and, and find out for you what feels awkward and, and then go search for solutions. I found that both the Foundry VTT Discord server and Reddit are pretty useful for getting answers for suggestions of what other DMs are looking. Uh, are doing. So don't go overboard, but take a look at what's out there. Usually it's there for a reason. One extra bit of advice I'll give is that you do not want to be the GM that is introducing a new module that impacts the players every single game. Whether you're running this game weekly or, or every few weeks or, or maybe less frequently, Players have to learn lots of software in their lives, not just for D&D. And the more learning you put on them every game, the longer it's gonna be before they are really feeling comfortable and feeling stable and feeling like they're becoming masters of the tools. Once they learn the modules that you put in front of them, and once those become natural to them, the Foundry VTT should just sort of melt out of the way. They won't really be thinking about it as much. They'll just be playing the game. Uh, but if you're introducing a new module at the beginning of every game and trying to teach them how to use it, tweaking and tuning and all of that all the time, it's going to get pretty distracting. So don't be that GM that is paying more attention to the tools than they are the players and how much fun they're having. Uh, 
the first module I want to get into is Tidy UI. I think it is a must have and it does one thing and it does it really simply. And it, it is that it makes it so that when you bring up the configuration settings, when you, you in a little gear and you know, look at the configure game settings, it defaults to the third tab, which is the module settings. And in that module settings, it will actually compact down all of the module configurations per module and give it a little plus minus thing that you know swings out and makes it expand. As you're learning your modules, this is incredibly valuable. And as you're realizing you need to go in there and make a quick uh, tweak, maybe even during a game, super valuable to be able to quickly, uh, you know, go through all the modules. Once you have some loaded, it is a massive amount of scrolling to go find the one that you're looking for and to find the settings that go with the module that you're looking for. Let's get into uh, further the modules that I think you're gonna find, get the most use out of if you're converting from Roll20. Obviously useful for everybody, but this is the big list. This is what I'm gonna go through. Let's do it. Okay, first we're gonna get into actually private roles. And I've got a little bit of a before and after. The default for Foundry is for when a GM selects private GM role, it shows up for the GM, but on the player view, uh, it, it shows up as a question mark. You don't know what die they rolled. You don't know what the result was, but you know the GM rolled something. This is meant to simulate sort of what happens in a actual game at the table, where the GM rolls behind the GM screen. You hear the dice, you know they rolled something. Maybe the GM's just bluffing you, but something happened. I, you know, I don't, uh, I, I, in Roll20, that's not what I did. That's not what I'm used to. I just kind of find it distracting. Sometimes I just want to test something uh, to see if it works. Sometimes I, I, I want the players to not really realize that I've got a whole bunch of mechanics and automation going that, that I'm just testing to make sure that it works. And so I, I just wanted to do nothing. I want it to be completely hidden. And that, that's what the actually private mo roles module does. The next module is better roles for 5e. So the default behavior of Foundry is that when you use one of the fully automated in your character sheet, rolls or like a roll button, it, it breaks out the action into a couple of different blocks that you then have to click. So if I click on my Warhammer, it brings up a chat box that has three boxes, attack, damage, uh, and, you know, maybe a different type of uh, alternative attack. You know, my Warhammer can be used two handed. It's a versatile. So you see there, my dwarf has uh, you know, three buttons. And then I have to click that button. A pop-up happens and it shows me advantage, disadvantage, all these various things. Uh, it, it turns into this whole wizard where I have to go through a set of clicks to do something that when I play in person, I don't do it in multiple steps. When I play D&D in person, I take all the dice I might need to roll and I roll it in a rolling tray and then I've got everything I need. So I take two D20s of different colors and I know that you know the, the blue one or something is the primary and the red one's the secondary. Uh, and if I'm rolling with advantage, you know I know it doesn't really matter which one's which, but in roll 20, I always rolled where the roll would go left, right, where I always roll with two dice. The damage is always rolled at the same time. Uh, and I just know between me and the GM whether or not I am rolling with advantage or not. And that's all I really need to know. I just need to know if it was a critical hit or something. And this module, Better Rolls for 5e, sort of takes the defaults of Foundry and, and makes it work a little bit more like what I'm expecting, which is with always rolling two 1d20s for the attack, always rolling the damage at the same time. And it even comes with some options for being able to have little damage application buttons so that I, you know, as the GM, I can look at the player's roll, click the monster, and then put my mouse over the apply damage button, and I can really quickly uh, apply and remove some of that damage. Next one is Beyond 20 Companion Module. If you use Beyond 20 in Roll20, uh, then you can also have those roles move from your Beyond your D&D Beyond character sheet over into Foundry. The formatting for that output isn't as pretty, but for players who are just using their character sheets in Beyond 20, don't want to mess with anything particular new in Foundry, this will definitely work and it'll let people learn their character and make changes and do things in D&D Beyond before they really have to invest any time in Foundry. And especially for things like spells, I, I find this is really useful. The Cautious Game Masters pack is one that I think you should look at and you should decide how you want to play. So 
I use it because uh, I want to make sure that I never have a character selected and then chat or type something and then it looks like that character is the one that did the talking or chatting. Uh, I just want to make it so that I'm always talking as me or one of the NPCs and this can do that for you. I want to make sure that if I have a hidden monster selected and then I start typing and I type something else, I don't accidentally reveal the metagame knowledge for the players that there's a hidden monster around because you know maybe there's some invisible stalker or something and it shows up in the chat before I've actually revealed it in game. Um, another nice feature of the Cautious Game Masters pack is it can make it so that the chat has that little pop-up that says, oh, somebody else is typing. You can get that to do do something, which is I think is kind of neat. It makes Foundry a little bit more interactive. If it gets annoying, I'll turn it off. Chat portrait, I like. Players are start associating their token with their character really quickly. So I use tokens that are different from the avatar significantly. So I have chat portrait in this set so that it'll put the picture that I mentally associate with the character or the character in combat uh, right next to its role. And I'm actually setting it to the token, not to the avatar, just because the, you know, as the players are trying to figure out, wait, which monster did the damage? They'll be able to figure that out quicker. Next, cozy player. There's a lot of options and settings in this one. So I've actually got a couple of slides to go through it. First, uh, it adds a couple of extra buttons inside the main kind of selecting menu for players. Things like marking I'm done with my turn. So if they're the character who's up in the initiative and they're done, they can hit the next button themselves to pass to the next person, saving the DM a click and making it really clear when their turn is over in combat. Uh, and also perhaps in, in some other modules, some advanced modules we'll go through later, signaling to the player who's next that, yeah, it's your turn. You can actually make pop-ups and notifications happen. It'll let, uh, it'll create this heart button that's really quick for you know, when you have a, a selected token modifying its HP a little bit more like a, maybe I'm used to in Roll20. And it has this neat feature where if there's a difference between selected and targeted, where I can select a bunch of targets with the targeting feature and then send the like buttons for them to the chat to say, hey, GM, I'm going to uh, target all of these and I believe I hit these tokens with my fireball and that, that might speed it up for the DM to be able to apply damage to those targets because you've already kind of pre-called them uh, in, in a lot of the automation. So there's a nice little these ones button that, that I like. Also in Cozy Player is what I decided to use for my token uh, tooltip. There are a lot of modules that add a tooltip. The reason I'm using this one is because it allows you to select not the actor's name, but instead the token's name. And when we get into token mo uh, mold, you'll see why. But sometimes I have a really short name for the token and a long name for the character. So for example, this is Cal Thunderstone. Cal Thunderstone's name needs to match pretty closely to what it, the character's name is in D&D Beyond for the Beyond 20 stuff to match up and line up. But the token can be much shorter so that the, the word doesn't overwhelm anybody who's displaying it, you know, maybe on the screen or displaying it in the token tooltip. Another reason this will be useful is if I have different, you know, uh, names for the monsters, if I have, you know, five kobolds, they could all be named something different. I don't want it from the actor, I want it from the token, and just by changing each of the token names, that's how we can make that be different. So it becomes more clear. Next, another thing to notice in Cozy Player is it has the hotkey for toggling between select and target. Very useful, it is it's the most commonly hit uh, quick key that I use, and funny enough, it's in Cozy instead of in the layer hotkeys, whatever. Next, this one's really simple, but it's amazing that it's not inside of, Roll, of uh, Foundry VTT by default, is deselection. Because I'm running in isometric, the area that's selected, that little highlight that's around the character can be pretty distracting. It's not uh, like a top-down view where the little selection uh, just helps me identify which token's mine if I leave it selected all the time. If I leave something selected all the time in isometric, you've got this sort of reticle that is on the character that's just always up and, and might be distracting compared to the nice pretty artwork that I put in the background. So I'm used to be able, in just about every app I use, I'm used to when I have something selected and I wanna deselect it, I just click somewhere that's blank. Works 
you know, when I'm using the desktop in my computer, it works in, in just about everything I use. Deselecting is done either by the escape key, which is, I believe, how it is normally done in, uh, in Foundry, or just by clicking somewhere else. Um, but clicking somewhere else is not the default in Foundry, and you need to have the deselection module to have something that I think your players are going to try and do and assume is the way it works. It just it was a lot easier once I installed this. My, my brain didn't have to switch over. Dice So Nice is a pretty neat module that adds 3D dice rolling to Foundry VTT. It allows you to change the colors. It allows you to tune how fast they fade away. Uh, it, it's pretty performant. I really like it. I like that you can have different colors for different characters or different people that are logged in at the very least. Um, it's interesting that some of the other freemium tools out there for D&D that, uh, that are out there are starting to monetize different dice colors and different dice sculpts. It's interesting. Hey, you, you gotta monetize the freemium stuff however you think is appropriate, totally cool. Um, but as a 3D modeler and artist, somebody who's done texture mapping, um, it's a pain for a very small number of lines of code or a very num short number of uh, minutes of artwork. Uh, I don't know. I'm not gonna stand on the way, but I, I just this is free. It's pretty good. Drag upload is something that I found really useful in Roll20, where sometimes a character would go and think of a crazy idea and maybe summon a monster or an animal that I wasn't expecting or maybe I would want to interact with something in the scene. And I realized if I went on Google image search, I could find a picture of exactly what I was looking for. But uh, if I have to go and in Foundry, uh, upload it to my server, you know, get it into the file directory structure, and then open up the file directory structure separately in Foundry VTT, navigate to the right place or search for the right thing, and then drag it over from this frankly, somewhat awkward file picker that's inside of Foundry compared to what I use on my actual computer. That was really awkward. So instead, if you have drag upload, you can drag and drop from your computer to the web browser directly, which is basically all I want to do, to create a new actor or to create a new tile. The really nice part about this is that you don't have to upload these pictures separately. Now, all these images are going to get dropped into a separate folder than maybe if you're building a big compendium of art assets and a folder structure inside your a Foundry data folder. So I do this for temporary things, but I find it really, uh, really quick. I had a ranger in my last game and the ranger would think of all kinds of crazy animals that they wanted to summon. Maybe that's the way animal summoning works or doesn't, but all these ideas were so creative and so funny that we always went with it because it was making the game more fun and I didn't want to get in the way of that. Uh, so really quickly, you know, I want to summon a Tyrannosaurus. Well, I've got a Tyrannosaurus. I want to summon, uh, summon a, you know, something else that would be really funny. Uh, okay, hold on. Give me a second. I'll find a token for that. And I need to get it over in, you know, less than a minute. Otherwise, I'm holding up the game. So really neat stuff to just be able to improvise when you're using your art using drag upload. Escape window is another one of those really basic things. If you hit escape when you have a window open, as opposed to a token selected, it closes the window. And that can be really distracting for players if they just have their character sheet up and they don't wanna go fish and navigate to that part of the character sheet that they were in. It can get pretty uh, annoying to have things close on you when you didn't intend them to. It takes longer to open them up than it did to close it. So uh, what I, I use the escape window, which makes it so that when you hit escape, it actually minimizes the window instead of closing it can be really useful if you've got a bunch of stuff open and you're just trying to get enough screen real estate, you wanna shove them to the side. So just tapping escape to get back to the game, but not necessarily closing all the journal entries and characters and NPCs that you had up, and it's gonna take you a while to go find again. So this can be a big, a big lifesaver if you're moving quickly. Everybody look is something that is uh, shockingly a little bit difficult to do elsewhere. If you activate a scene and your players are all over the place, um, activating the scene triggers a lot of things. It might start music. It might you know, do lots of things inside the automation of your game. But as your characters are moving around between the scenes that they're allowed to navigate on, 
Everybody Look allows a separate function, so you don't have to reactivate a scene, which would involve activating some other scene to activate the one you actually want people to stay on. So you can pull Alt to scene to say, hey, everybody, stop looking at the map, stop looking at the you know handouts or the loading screen or other areas I let you go to. I want to pull everybody to the scene um, so that we're focusing on the game or, or everybody has an opportunity to see something. So it adds this pull all to scene button that is very useful. Now this is a complex one if you haven't used Foundry, but it's something that you're probably gonna want. If you're using dynamic lighting, if you have walls, then as the GM, you're gonna find that sometimes in the course of the game, you need to take a player, pick them up and move them somewhere. Maybe across a wall, you're teleporting them, something like that. Something the player can't do for themselves is either they don't know where they're going or there's a wall in the way. So when that's the case, um, there is a something in Foundry that defaults that's a little annoying. And that is that when you are dragging them as the GM, because you have them selected, it's automatically making it so that you're seeing the world from their perspective with their understanding of the dynamic lighting. So here I am on the left trying to drag this wizard over a wall, but I can't see where I'm dragging to. So imagine, you know, there's things that trigger when I drag them over there, or maybe some of the stuff over there is a little complex. I need to drag them in exactly the right place so as not to reveal any secrets for them. If that's the case, then um, the defaults for Foundry aren't very useful because you're kind of taking a risk every time you drag them over there. You might reveal some metagame knowledge or put them on the wrong side of the wall and let them see the whole dungeon, something you don't want to do. So GM token drag visibility makes it so that when I'm dragging a player token, I have the GM's view of, you know, line of sight, which is it ignores walls. Uh, and I can put them in exactly the right place. And then once I'm done dragging them, it's, it will snap back to uh, more or less what the player sees, which is what I wanted if they're still selected. Layer hotkeys uh, is something that I used all the time in Roll20. I got pretty quick, especially when I'm rigging a scene, when I'm you know loading in all these custom art assets or really setting things up. I'll jump around between dynamic lighting and the tiles and the various things. Roll20 had this concept of advanced quick keys and layers so that you would keep things organized. Foundry is a little bit different, but still having to go to the left hand menu to switch between all of these various tools, you know, eventually you want to move faster. So layer hotkeys at least add some hotkeys to move between the different tools. I kind of would still prefer being able to have like as many layers as I want for organizing the various layers of tiles and tokens and changing layer visibility. I, I'm, I'm waiting for, there's probably already is a module that does half of that, um, but I, I'd like something like that uh, eventually, but we're, we're not there yet. Um, you know, I, I'm looking forward to layers being a bigger thing, but at least having the hotkeys for the things that Foundry VTT does really does speed up some time for me. Next module is multiple wall pointer, multiple wall point mover. It's a mouthful. Once you have it turned on, you won't think about it anymore. By default, you can only move the walls one vertex at a time. You click on it, you drag it, and then you start breaking the walls in order to move them. Sure, you can use the wall selection tool to select a large number of walls, but that only really works if they're in an isolated area. You're not accidentally going to select other vertices that are involved in some other part of the scene. So multiple wall point mover makes it so that if you hold the alt key and select a vertex, those vertices that make kind of like a closed loop or, or, or a, you, know, you know, that are overlapping each other so as to indicate like a, a polygonal line will all get selected and then you can drag them over. I, you can, this is really useful for, you know, making and cloning walls that are the same shape. Maybe you've got multiple columns and you're trying to adjust things perfectly. You can move them all at once so that once you've got it so that there's no gaps in those walls, now you can move the walls around without having to recheck for gaps. Really nice. Pings is a feature that I definitely missed switching over from Roll20. I am used to the defaults in Roll20, which is that when you hold a click, it shows the players here, here's where I'm at, this is where that thing is. And if I do it with the shift click, it even moves all the vantage points of the players. It zooms and scrolls their windows so that I can see that spot. So it is no surprise 
that this pings module, the default behavior in this long set of settings is just what Roll20 does so that you can have that feature again. It's really nice. It's even better than the Roll21 because it puts the name of the person and is a little bit better animated so it hangs out there and you don't have to do it multiple times. It kind of hangs out for a number of configurable seconds. Token Action HUD makes it so that when you have a character selected, it goes through their character sheet and makes this movable wall line of buttons with sort of hierarchical navigation inside the major folders. So you know, you select spells and all the spells you have ready to cast uh, flow out. Yeah, super useful. It makes it so you almost never have to open your character sheet. It makes it so that your whole character sheet sort of has automation. This is frankly above and beyond what Roll20 was capable of. Roll20 let you take stuff from your character sheet and drag it to a macro bar. It let you took to uh, macros and assign them as token macros so that they would show up whenever you had something selected. But uh, having the token action HUD makes it so that every single uh, monster or character that you have uh, rigged with a NPC or character character sheet is suddenly has all of its module buttons pre-set up and organized, uh, whether it's reading the rules for some part of them or, or something else. Super useful. I get a million questions on this. Token Action HUD is definitely one that you should add on if you're going to be using any of the character sheet functions of say the, the Dungeons and Dragons 5e uh, world, you know, what the game setting you know inside there i believe this also works for pathfinder but it, you know you're gonna have to make sure that it works with your game system and token mold i'm gonna go through a couple of my favorite features here one of the favorite things i like about token mold is because i use a module that everybody talks about which is vtta to import stuff over from dnd beyond that i bought over in dnd beyond into my foundry vtt when it imports it, it doesn't it does import the character sheet that says what the token size is, but it doesn't really set up the tokens. Um, but token mold can kind of add some automation that makes it so that when you drag something from your actors over to the scene, it can modify it on the way from the prototype to the one that actually gets created on the scene. One of my favorite settings is one in here that makes it so set token size to creature uh, so it's sized according to its size in the character sheet. So you can see the before and after. Before you have all these monsters that are of different size, but then after I have that you know, checkbox enabled, when I drag them over, they take up the correct number of squares, which is awesome. And maybe even apply some defaults like you know, adding up uh, the hit point bars or other things that uh, I as the GM want in there for whatever I'm picking. So I, I find I can control how the tokens work better with token mold than I can by changing my server defaults. Next inside of token mold is getting through the ability to have multiple copies of the same monster by checking the little name box when you're you know, in the token mold above actors. You can make it so that multiple copies of the same actor will get a little, you know, it'll change the name either by post fixing a, uh, you know, a suffix, right, uh, onto the end of the uh, character name or perhaps replacing the entire character name with something random so that uh, maybe players don't need to know what kind of monster it is. Maybe you just pull from a rollable table of creepy words or something. So very useful in something like a Call of Cthulhu game. You don't, in Call of Cthulhu, you never want to let the players know what the name of the monster is. You want to have it be just some unknowable horror. So, and that would be incredibly useful. So before you can have, say here you see four kobolds and they show up all in the initiative order, all looking very different. But after, check it out, I've got four kobolds. When I mouse over them, because I'm taking the token name uh, it's given it a different token name, slightly different per monster. And then in the initiative, you can actually see the different names there. So that if I know, hey, I'm the one who's gonna beat up on uh, Kobold B, then people can figure out which one that is and you can communicate about it verbally um, to know which one's which, maybe, maybe it helps you out. All right, so that is what we were able to go through this time. We talked about whether or not you need modules, my one must have, which is tidy UI and then the modules I found most useful when I was converting over from Roll20. In the future, I'm gonna do other videos and I hope you come along for that. All right, so that, that was fun. If you liked the video, subscribe. I'm gonna be starting a new D&D game, probably D&D, 
I'm gonna be starting a new game pretty soon, so that's probably gonna create a bunch of prep time for me in Foundry VTT, and I'm gonna have to learn what I like to do and how I like to do this. Uh, I gonna post useful stuff and if you like this type of content please subscribe so uh you know the channel grows thanks everybody